Wish you could fish more anywhere, anytime. Rod Geeks, a St. Croix Rod's partner, has developed a 42-inch one-piece travel rod designed and built with the same technology found in St. Croix Rods. This travel rod is offered as a kit that comes with the RG42 rod, spinning reel, fishing line, pliers, and tackle tray. All in a case with space for your wallet, phone, and fishing license. Just grab and go. Perfect to keep in your pickup, car, or RV. This shorty performs much like a longer rod, but is compact enough for easy storage and for on-the-go use. Make this the summer you fish more. RodGeeks.com GuideFitter.com GuideFitter, bridging you to the outdoors while providing a quality platform for guides and outfitters for you to select from. GuideFitter is the best place to get discounts on gear if you're an outdoor professional. As a game warden, I'm a member of the Outdoor Government Program, which has over 80 quality brands to get discounts from. It's free to join. Yes, free to join. And all you need to do is prove that you're an active outdoor government employee. There are all kinds of products available. Apparel, boots, archery equipment, optics, backpacks, cameras, watches, ammo, anything, you name it. And while you're there, check out the articles, information, and stories that you'll be inspired from. So before you head out to work in the outdoors or start your next outdoor adventure, check out GuideFitter.com and get discounts on your everyday or every so often outdoor equipment. This is Game Warden Wayne Saunders for GuideFitter. Wireless Partners building the first net cellular network for AT&T in New Hampshire, Maine, and Vermont to ensure first responders can always communicate in emergency situations so you know help is on the way when you need it. Wireless Partners is partnering for success with communities, local and state government, local business, and visitors. Wireless Partners, building cellular networks for you. This podcast is brought to you by Maine Operation Game Thief. Please join me, Game Warden Wayne Saunders, and other Game Wardens on our adventures protecting wildlife, saving lives, and having fun, all while serving the public and the natural resources of our planet. Listen to the tales and experience of those who work in the outdoors while being entertained with stories about encounters with poachers, wildlife investigation, murder investigation, near-death experiences, search and rescue missions, wildlife interactions from game wardens around the country and around the world. When I retired, I realized I couldn't let go of that legacy, but rather wanted to share the passion commitment and the stories of those men and women that call themselves Game Wardens. This is Game Warden, Wayne Saunders, and this is Warden's Watch. Thanks for joining me here at the Warden's Watch podcast. And I'm going to update you guys because if you've been listening to my podcast, you've been listening to the advertisement for the Northwoods Throwdown event. This was a softball game between Maine Game Wardens in New Hampshire, both featured on Northwoods Law, so you may have seen a lot of the personalities that played there. I just wanted to update you because it's over, it's done, New Hampshire won 7-5, to five. but that's not the point. The point is we got some great game wardens together to play softball and raise money. So we raised money for Operation Game Thief Maine, Operation Game Thief New Hampshire, International Wildlife Crime Stoppers, and we had an awesome, awesome, awesome event. I want to take my hat off to the main game wardens that put this on. Greg Serpis, who's had a former podcast with me. He was kind of the ringleader in this event. Just an outstanding family event. It was very engaging. I had the opportunity to be one of the announcers, and it was an awesome, awesome experience for me because I got to get up there and root for my team, New Hampshire. Chris Dyer, main game warden, was in the box with me, along with my producer, Jay Scott who just did a great job at calling the game. And it was a good it was a good way to do it because Maine could talk about Maine. I could talk about New Hampshire. And then we kind of had a neutral party in there with Jay Scott. It was um, an outstanding way to do it. We had some great commentaries, some not so great commentaries, some mistakes. But we had a lot of fun. The players had a lot of fun. And it was a nail-biting softball game, which was incredible in itself. So the seventh inning, we only went to seven innings, but the bases are loaded. Maine has bases loaded. They're up to bat. They got one of their heavy hitters up. And the game right now is seven to five. This could this could win the game for them. No pressure or anything. Their heavy hitter clips the ball, puts it up into a high pop up fly to the infield. Uh, Conservation officer James Benvenuti with New Hampshire comes in, makes the catch 
to seal the deal 7-5. It was an awesome game. Each team did an incredible, incredible job and had a lot of fun doing it. And the camaraderie was just outstanding. No matter what your, your, your patch says on your shoulder, you're a game warden and you're, you're playing with your brothers and having fun. And there's always competition among brothers. Always will be. But I am so happy that I was a part of that. So I just wanted to wrap it up for those listeners that didn't have the opportunity to join us that day. Uh, and again, just for, for doing it, Maine, I appreciate it. Hopefully we'll be hosting one in New Hampshire next year and you'll have an opportunity to list it, listen to it through uh, Warden's Watch is my plan. Episode 13, Grant Hacking, world-renowned wildlife artist. I really enjoyed this interview because it's kind of off the beaten path. It's not a game warden interview. It's a wildlife artist, and wildlife art just uh, instills something in me. Uh, the Ward Museum down in Maryland, I used to go there a lot. Uh, wildlife carvers, decoy carvers, are renowned decoy carvers are, are, are there. Um, their work is there. The wildlife art is there. And, it, and it's just amazing that we can see these things up close and personable and get that feeling just like we were in nature if we got to see this. But it's captured. That moment is captured. And you get to experience it every time you see it. Unlike wildlife, people sit for hours and hours and hours just to get a glimpse of the wildlife. And when a wildlife artist captures that glimpse, it's very special. It's very spiritual, especially if you experience that, if you had an experience with that animal and you see that wildlife art and it pops for you, it brings you back to that moment. And, and Grant's a great individual. He understands wildlife law enforcement. He understands that that's a piece of the management program. And he wants to be a part of that. He wants to be a part of helping stop poaching. He is part of International Wildlife Crime Stoppers. He is the Wildlife Crime Stopper artist. So it's it's really cool to, to hang out with Grant, to talk to him about where he's been, where he's going, where he's come from, um, and, and get inside into a wildlife artist. Uh, Grant is a good friend of mine. And it all started with International Wildlife Crime Stoppers Conference here in New Hampshire. And we've uh, continued to be friends. We've continued to enjoy each other. We continue to hang out. And uh, we, we have a good rapport. And I, I, I really enjoyed this interview. It's kind of a sorbet, so to speak, to cleanse the palate, uh, the game warden stories. Uh, we're going to continue with those. But I want to do something different, you know, and get 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 other people involved with wildlife law enforcement, whether it's funding, whether it's supporting, whether it's reporting wildlife crimes. Uh, And that's you. That's you, the listener, too. And I want you to get involved uh, because it's just not the game wardens out there. It's all of us working towards a goal together. And I appreciate Grant helping me work towards that goal and and all game wardens. Uh, What a great opportunity to talk to a a world-renowned wildlife artist that lives so close to me and is such a unique individual. I think you guys are going to really enjoy this, and you'll be able to check out Grant's art. Go to International Wildlife Crime Stoppers. There's two prints available there, and it's a, it's a fundraiser, so they're, they're, they're priced fundraiser prices, but Grant donated the proceeds of all the prints to go to International Wildlife Crime Stoppers to help stop poaching. So it's, it's, a, it's a big deal to have Grant on as a partner, as the, our wildlife artist pretty awesome thing for it to continue and he's very proud of that and uh, it's just been a great experience i'm sure you guys have wildlife art experiences so sit back enjoy get some insight get some insight into somebody a little different than the game wardens but i think each game warden can appreciate a wildlife artist because every one of us has wildlife art hanging in our homes to remember that moment and remember why we protect the wildlife I'm going to call you a world-renowned wildlife artist. <laughs> I've been called worse. It's pretty neat because uh, the way I get to meet Grant, I was the president of International Wildlife Crime Stoppers. And what that means in a nutshell, that's, that's a big term, but you run the conference that year. 
And that's a big deal. Yeah, it was fun. And to me, wildlife, law enforcement, wildlife, biology, all that wildlife has always connected to me to art because you bring the, 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 the wildlife and nature into people's houses. Yeah, I mean, this, this country is, you know, outdoors and sporting is such a popular pastime in this country. And for me, it just, you know, lends itself to what I do for artwork. It's perfect. And uh, yeah, meeting you guys was a lot of fun. I learned a whole different side of the wildlife. Yeah, it was it was awesome because I'm trying to think of unique things for the conference. And, you know, I'm just Googling wildlife artists and, you know, your name pops up, Grant Hacking. And I'm like, huh, Grant Hacking. I thought, you know, maybe I'd see your art in the diner or something for nine ninety nine or something <laughs> like that. I, I never expected to, to, to come across a, a man of your talents and stuff. So, you know, so the first time I met with Grant, you know, I explained International Wildlife Crime Stoppers that, you know, we're just not in the United States. We're in Canada and we focus just generally in North America, but we're around the world. We want to be expanding. And Grant's art lent so much to that because you do all kinds of areas around the world, don't you? Yeah, paint from both Africa, North America, a little bit of Europe. Uh, painted pretty much every animal that I can think of. There's very few things I haven't painted. And uh, a little bit of sporting art, etc. Um, and I, I've always had a passion for conservation as most wildlife artists do because you know it's something we want to see around and we don't want to lose it and that pretty much is uh, the same applies to hunters we want the animals around we want you know want them abundant and, uh, and a resource for a, you know for for working from yeah, because I, like I say, it's about conservation. It's not preservation. It's about finding the habitat and finding how many animals can be in that habitat and be healthy in that habitat. So, yeah, hugely important. Yeah, so it's, it's all conservation, not preservation. So it is about taking out a few animals here and a few animals there, you know, and I'm sure you've experienced in Africa, that's how they fund a lot of their, you know, conservation efforts. Oh, yeah, it's, it's huge. I mean, you know, the, most of the farms in there that would, ne would never exist if it wasn't for people coming in and hunting on the farms, etc. I mean, it's uh, photo ph photographing, hunting, tourism, it all, it's, it's, it's huge. Mm. So, so I, I told Grant about IWC, International Wildlife Crime Stoppers, and uh, he said, that's exactly, I've been looking for something like this. So I introduced Grant to our group, and he brought in this leopard that he had done. And to be honest with you, I never thought I'd be interested in something, you know, exotic like a leopard painting. And that just stunned me because it was so awesome of this leopard looking over the savanna and were they kudu that he was looking at or well, there was sab um, sable sable <laughs> running so, yeah you know and, and it was just uh again like i said you're bringing that wildlife into your home and it just had a dramatic effect on me thinking you know yeah what was i so narrow-minded that i was just thinking that you know an animal like that wouldn't affect me just because it was from across the globe so and uh certainly that was cool and we adopted that as our international painting right and then I wanted a national painting for North America. You remember that whole mess? <laughs> it was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. You, you were so mad at me. I mean, <laughs> and I wanted an eagle because our, our first painting, you know, it represented North America. And I just think that the bald eagle is the representation of North America. So wouldn't you agree? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you and you like to do birds, right? I love painting birds. I've been painting birds for many years and painted a lot of bald eagles, of course, you wanted all sorts of things in the painting. I, I, <laughs> Made and, a little more difficult. Yes, and the first one he shows me, he's catching a fish. And I'm like, yeah, that isn't what I had in mind. <laughs> <laughs> picky clients. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, picky clients that aren't paying a thing. And, uh, you know, I wanted the grandeur, the the, 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 the scenery. And I just said, you know, kind of like that leopard is what I pictured, uh, the scenery behind it, the magnificence of it. And uh, and then we want, went on a hunt for photos and uh, specimens of eagles. So, and Grant's a picky guy. <laughs> yeah, well, I got picky clients. Yes. And, and he wanted certain things. And, you know, so I got some photos actually from Game Warden. So the, 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 the print we did, and we have prints available on International Wildlife Crime Stop. Well, go to, go to wildlifecrimestoppers.org and you can see Grant's pictures there those are prints in there what the g clays 
They are uh, yeah, G-clays, yeah, and correct. What's a G-clay? Can you tell us that? It's, it's just a fancy word. It's a French word um, that means to spray. France, so it's always yeah, fancy, it's, isn't it? <laughs> it's basically just a, 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 a print that's made on canvas and it, the ink is sprayed on. So that's, that's the way prints are made nowadays. Uh, that's what it is. So it looks like a painting. It basically. looks exactly like a painting. And I, sometimes when I get those prints in from the printer, I'm shocked at how close it looks to the original. The only difference is there's just you know a little bit of texture missing. It's incredible. Yeah, no, I, I would say it was incredible. So, but so we we did that and we started this eagle project. And so I'm getting pictures from wardens and trying to get Grant into actually photograph eagles himself. But it's a wrong time of year because it's was it fall and they were fighting or when were they were fighting? There was, there was something they didn't want to put you in the same pen with the eagles because they were afraid. Probably because it was cold and I hate the cold. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and yeah, so the eagles, that, that it was just the wrong time of year to get get those really good close-ups. So we got close-ups other ways. Uh, the avian uh, group in Maine was uh, very helpful in getting some photos too. Right, so, right. So anyways, we got those and Grant does this magnificent painting of uh, two bald eagles in a nest oh, and one's just leaping off into the air and... The, the scenery behind it is just stunning. So and, and do you get those sceneries? Mm-hmm. That, was that scenery something in your head or was that yeah, something that, from somewhere else? Most of my settings are, are imagination. That's what that's where I really enjoy wildlife art. The subject matter I have to get reference and take photographs and I'll go out to Yellowstone or go to Africa and take photographs of animals, um, thousands of them luckily with digital now. But um, So I'll work from... A couple of photographs on the animals but all my settings and my scenes are made up and that's where the fun comes it's you know using your imagination and making it into an exciting scene um that's that's my enjoyment and, and you change it up too because i came in today and uh, you had a moose that you didn't like you had it all done and you didn't like it and you started redoing it again and it's like half done now and you go from a water scene to a field scene well, what's going on with that i don't often do that but every now and again i'll look at a painting and think dang that just needs a dark background or it just needs something a bit more moody and or i just might be in a mood myself that day and attack it with the paints and i usually regret it afterwards think oh <laughs> maybe we went too far here and have to throw it out um, it's not something I do a lot, but usually a painting. If you did it a lot, you'd be out of business, wouldn't yeah, you? I know, but sometimes you just see something in a painting that you got to got to correct, and it's it's actually a bit of a problem that I have. I when I'm finished a painting, I try and get it out of the out of the studio as fast as I can. If I can get it into a gallery or to a client or uh, into a show, it's a um, good idea for me because if they hang around too long, I'll wind up doing something that I regret. Yeah, and looking at your own artwork, you just constantly think, oh, I've got to change this, I've got to change that. So, And I look at your artwork and I'm going, how the heck did he do that? You know, that's just, you know, it's the differences for some that has talent and someone who doesn't have talent. Oh, I so, appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. So do you have an art gallery you deal with that actually hangs your stuff and sells it? I have a, a very few. Um, I have, oh gosh, three or four, I think at, at this point, only four galleries that... Um, carry my work it's just really hard keeping galleries supplied and doing commissions and shows so the i have a gallery out in colorado called paderewski fine art i have one in um jackson hole uh, that is um mountain trails gallery and one in florida called the plainsman gallery and lastly the audubon um, gallery in charleston south carolina carries my work so i just got those four galleries that I really struggle to keep supplied, um, so it's hard taking on more. And then I'll do approximately two major shows every year. The one is in um, Southeastern Wildlife Expo in Charleston, South Carolina, and then lastly I do the big um, Safari Club International, which this next year will be held in Reno, and they switch between Reno and Vegas. And the contrast between the two shows is safari club international is basically a hunting show and i just show up with artwork and sell um and the southeastern wildlife expo is a is an actual art show so that's a they're pretty different from one another but i love them both they're um, exciting to do a lot of fun a lot of interesting people yeah because hunters love wildlife art oh yeah i mean they you know 
they just they got to have a piece of African artwork and <laughs> they've all been there they've all been hunting there and I'll get some crazy commissions for some crazy stuff and it's a lot of fun for me yeah because it's a piece of their memories it's a piece of their experience that they're going to hang on the wall that you're going to bring to life absolutely yeah. and yeah. Uh, you know a lot of them have, have game trophy rooms or you know rooms with their rifles etc and they love putting artwork next to it and it looks beautiful too yeah no I'm sure it blends extremely well so. oh yeah and and the money that they spend to go to there that goes to all these good causes to promote, you know, positive things. A huge amount. People don't may may not realize how much money goes towards um, back into the system for conservation. Um, all these safari club chapters put just a ton of money back into conservation and keeping the game there. Um, Africa, of course, largely thrives on it. A large part of um, you know their their economy comes from it so without that a lot of this game would probably not fare as well if you travel around southern africa or most uh, if you tra- travel around southern africa you'll see just tons of game farms um where they keep the animals look after them they spend a lot of money on them and uh they wouldn't be there if it wasn't for people going over there hunting i don't hunt myself um um, if I shot something, I'd probably feel awful, but that's just me. Um, I don't know. Maybe if I was stuck out somewhere and you put a rifle in my hand, I might shoot a bird, but <laughs> I'd probably feel bad for the next month. But uh, So I live vicariously through hunters. In fact, this weekend I was down in Georgia and following a hunter around and um, just taking photographs, and it's just so much fun. I mean, the, the place, you know, the farm we were on was beautiful, and they – they spend a ton of money keeping the the farm in a condition where the um, pheasant and grass and you know that etc would will come in and and live and um, and stay and stay yeah and it's you know there's a tremendous goes in amount goes into it it's not an easy thing yeah. no absolutely and I I think that's what's really neat about you Grant is you're not a hunter but you can appreciate what a hunter brings into conservation. So, and I think if more people knew about that, they would appreciate hunters more because we're not just about killing, you know, it's, it's more about the experience. It's more oh, yeah. about, it's, it's the experience. I mean that, you know, we just, with everything, we have some bad apples, but mm-hmm. tr- truly if for most people, it's that experience of being outdoors. I know a lot of people, um, very, some of them very wealthy who, for years of hunted and then eventually they pick up a camera and they trade the camera for a rifle it's it's not so much about shooting something i think as much as it is about just being in the bush experiencing it and i live vicariously through hunters i mean i i'm not an outdoors person in fact the outdoors scares me but <laughs> i like to be at you know looking at what other people do and what they experience and what they see and and i and i get that excitement when i get a commission and I kind of listen to their story and it puts me in, in that spot. And that's why I love painting, because I can take that imagination and kind of build it onto a canvas. And it's a lot of fun. So you did that, sit down and do an interview, so to speak, when you get a commission? Yeah, just try and listen to them, try and listen to what they say. You know, they'll, they'll be talking about... It's funny, they a lot of people who hunt and commission paintings they don't talk so much about the hunt they'll talk about the scenery and you know what was happening and you can like, kind of listen to the background story and it and I, that's fascinating and I'll I'll hear all sorts of things I'll kind of hear what time of day it was and what the lighting was doing and then I'll try and do an animal kind of with that setting and um yeah usually it's successful it's great yeah, fun and, and I'm sure people are very detailed because I can bring myself back into just with deer hunting you know it's it almost uh, burns in your soul the the whole the, the feel of the day the the crunch yeah. of the snow you know the the animal as he came in how he came in and you know it's just uh yeah it, it's 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 an experience it's not about pulling the trigger it really is you know uh, I always say that, and I've said this many times but if you go back you know and our ancestors their life and death survival depended on the, on the wildlife around them and we still have that instinctual feeling you go out in the bush i don't care if you've got a camera or just a walking stick or a rifle the rush that you feel when you you know you hear a big elk bugling a mm. couple of yards from you it's it's just amazing i mean the hair will stand up on your neck and it leaves an impression you know and 
I find I feel it's kind of a privilege to be able to try and capture that on the, on canvas. You know, for me, it's uh, it's a it's a great feeling. And if I pull a painting off that I feel does that conveys that feeling, I've done a good job. No, no doubt. And uh, you know, I'm sure people notice that Grant kind of talks funny, so he doesn't talk <laughs> like I do. So, you know, so you you, you kind of got born into artist and born into an area that you know was conducive for wildlife art no oh, yeah i was i had a i had probably one of the most magical childhoods anybody could ever have um yeah when when i was young we lived up in zimbabwe um i remember when i was a kid we had neighbors who had uh, dogs and they would keep getting into my mo- my mom's kitchen <laughs> and, <laughs> and one night she heard this rummaging in the kitchen and she flew out in her night gun, grabbed the closest frying pan and went chasing after what she thought were dogs. <laughs> and um, she ran around the house and when she got to the other side of the house, there was this huge leopard in the moonlight just staring at her. <laughs> I think the leopard was just as terrified as she was when she figured out. <laughs> Luckily, the leopard decided to leap over a 10-foot game fence without even blinking. It was just, you know, up and over the game fence, not a problem. And thank God it didn't turn on my mom. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I had wonderful experiences. I remember as a kid going to a hotel and having a breakfast and uh, this giraffe stuck its head right through the window, grabbed the breakfast, you know, <laughs> just fun things like that. Watching uh, dung beetles scoop up dung would be a fascinating thing as a kid for hours absolutely, on end. Absolutely, yeah. So it was... It'd be a fascinating thing for me now. I'd probably yeah, watch it for hours. <laughs> absolutely. So, uh, yeah, I, I had a I had a very wonderful childhood and um, I guess that, you know, influenced what I do what, Were your parents the influencing and in well, your art? Both my parents uh, painted. My, my mom and dad actually met at art school. Um, so we went up with that in my blood and then the love of the wildlife and watching you know things like that growing up just just i loved wildlife so i decided to paint wildlife and uh my mom and my dad painted landscape my mother painted still life so i just kind of so went with you that. just took the other aspect yep. of it so in landscape a lot of african landscape i'm assuming right correct yeah and is that why they lived in Africa? Was because of the art and the landscape? And yeah, um, well, yes and no. Uh, after the war, I guess uh, a lot of people were immigrating. All over, you know, my dad's from England, so mm-hmm. a lot of people immigrated after the war, and South Africa was a good place to go. Um, he just he was in art school as a kid in in England, and like I say, he met my mother in art school when he went to South Africa, and um, just started doing well, you know, landscape painting. Now, was that a hobby or was that their full-time business? It, it's for, for my dad, it was a hobby in the beginning. But eventually, he, he kept you know, giving his art away and then started selling it. And then I remember, I remember when I was very little, one day he came home and he said, you know, I'm making more money at this than I am working. So he quit, he quit his job and went full-time. And nice. of course, that's when everything stopped selling. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course. The starving uh, artist syndrome. The star- he was panicking at first, but uh, it took off, and, and he did extremely well at his at his artwork. And uh, I guess as a kid, I always saw that and just figured it was a natural thing to do. You don't, you know, there's not, no such thing as a starving artist. This is how you make your money. I didn't think differently, and I came to this country, and it was a bit of a shock. All of a sudden, I had to figure out how to actually do what I do and, and make a living out of it. And it was it was tough at first. I um I did a show in um in Virginia at the Wildlife um World Wildlife Federation and it went extremely well. But then I was kind of lost. I the way we sold paintings back home was very different to the way things are done here and it was a learning curve. So for, for a while, I would work part-time jobs at banks. I think most of the banks in, in America hate me because I'd work with them for about three months and then quit so I could go do an exhibition. And then I'd be broke again. I'd have to go back to a bank job. And so it went. So uh, And then eventually it just it clicked. Everything started falling into place. I started getting a name and was able to do more and more wildlife shows and uh and that's what I've been doing. So I've I've pretty much painted all my life, you know, with a few hiccups in between. Now, did you do North American before you got to North America? No. Um, and again, as as my mother would always say, I always learn, land with my bum in butter. I'm always lucky. 
I came to this country, um, when I first came here, everybody was painting ducks. That's all there was, just duck paintings. Yeah, we had duck stamps. Duck stamp, we had that competition was for yep. duck stamps. We had the junior duck stamp art Yep, I remember all that. I remember it well. And I remember looking around thinking, oh, my goodness, <laughs> what am I going to do? I can't, can, you, can you paint ducks? I, at the time, no, I <laughs> never painted a duck. And... Um, yeah, it was it was a little tricky, and I, I of course only did African wildlife at that time, and I, so eventually I, I begged the show just to put me in, and they looked at my work and they said, well, we'll give you a bit of a shot. Yeah, it was a very small local show. Well, I had doing that show, and this lady came by and she said, well, we run a big show called the Waterfowl Festival every year. She said, if you promise to pay me a token duck. <laughs> then you can bring your African stuff and we'll see what happens. <laughs> well, I guess at that time, I don't know, a lot of people were getting tired of the ducks and um, African travel was becoming hugely popular in this country. And um, I took all these little paintings of African scenes and I sold out. I so even sold my duck painting. <laughs> Everything sold. And What uh, kind of duck was it? <laughs> It was a Canada goose. Okay. And I remember, I remember getting interviewed at the, with the, the, the newspaper and they called it a, can, a, a, can, a Canadian goose. And they were like, they corrected me. They were like, no, they're not Canadian goose. The geese, they're a, 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 Absolutely. <laughs> and I'm glad you said it correctly the first time because I probably would have corrected. I, I correct my 13-year-old all the time. I have to catch myself yeah. when I say that. Yeah, so, and they're uh, not seagulls either. No, they're just they're gulls. gulls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I, it went well. And um, I just... At that time, African art seemed to just become the most popular thing that you could paint. I, I was just, I, I couldn't paint them fast enough and they were selling really well. And I Then I started getting invited to other shows and I was winning awards. Um, and yeah, I just, it was amazing. I just lucked out and just, I was, that's all I was doing. Then eventually I started realizing that I wanted to branch out and start doing North American. So I started traveling around, going to see Yellowstone. Do you remember what your first North American painting was? Oh, man, it was bad, that's all I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I, not, I think it was a mule deer gone terribly wrong. <laughs> In fact, I still to this day, when I paint North American, I've really got to focus because the animals here are very difficult they're you know they don't have the lovely spots and stripes to help you along and um and generally most of them are like a beautiful browny gray mm. which are just tough colors to to on your palette you know it's uh, they're they're hard and they're slightly prehistoric looking i mean if you look at a pronghorn and, uh, you know, and even an elk you know they got that little weird look to them and a moose i mean you mm. know they're very odd okay. animals so um as as Bill Bryson said, moose is a badly drawn car, and he's right on. They they're tough. So yeah, North American taken me a while to kind of get better at, and um, the whole scene you know, painting snow that, that was such a trick at first. It's just yeah. white, yeah, <laughs> right? You think it's like painting sky. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was a, it. Was a learning curve, but now now I'm torn, and uh, I keep every year I try to analyze it because it is my business it's what i do for a living and i'll look at my sales and i'm like dang i seem to sell just as many african as i do north american so i just keep going with a split personality and just doing doing both you know so do you get bored with one and switch back to the other or i i do a little and that's what's kind of fun for me so during the winter i seem to paint a lot more african stuff maybe just because it's cold out there and i want to paint something warm um and then during the summer i'll do a lot more north american scenes um yeah, so when I start getting tired of one subject, I'll switch to the other. And that kind of keeps my art fresh and interesting. And and right now I'm going down the, a different path. I'm starting to do more sport, sporting art. I just, um, like I say, just came back from a hunting pres um, farm. And I want to start doing paintings of people walking with their hunting dogs and just uh, that kind of thing, maybe some pheasant hunting shots i don't know we'll see and um starting to do a lot more uh fishing scenes like marlin uh, dolphin you know coming out of the water with the line on them so that'll be exciting you know that whole corner is probably full you know guy harvey's got that corner so <laughs> yeah it's one thing i've learned this is a big country there's enough room for me to squeeze in <laughs> I'm just going to do it better <laughs> or differently. You know, the first time I heard about Guy Harvey, the guys from Florida sent up a book that was signed by Guy Harvey of all his art and everything. I, I put it in the wrong raffle. They saw that and they were mortified. And <laughs> so I learned a lot about Guy Harvey really quick. So yeah. um, I'll plug him a little too. But 
yeah. yeah, it's it's been a learning phase for for Art and me, especially that that was the IWC conference too. So, well, for, for most, you know, it's funny. A lot of people who buy my work, even myself. I mean, you know, it's the, the actual art theory of it and the whole what's collectible and what's not collectible and who's famous and who's not. It's really that's for museum creators. You know, you, mm-hmm. it, it's. Mostly people buying artwork just buy them because they love them. They they want to, you know, mm-hmm. and if they happen to get something that's going to go up in value, and they like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah. it's it's experienced by looking at it. So, um, you know, I, I like I said, I talk about that leopard that, that you had, and, and, you know, that just stirred me up. And, you know, the eagles I, I look at every day. So, you know, it's just impressive. And, you know, everybody else can go to wildlifecrimestoppers.org and get the prints that we try to raise money with that you did so and they're signed and stuff like that so that, right that. and I, I guess on on that note i should even plug my website and if people do want to look at my artwork um just uh, type in my name just www.granthacking.com hacking just like hacking a computer you might get some other sites that you don't want to see but. yeah yeah i don't know <laughs> if that was a good one <laughs> So you hold, we talk about your wildlife art and how museum creators, but you hold several awards, don't you? Yeah, I've done done well. I've won quite a few. Um, my most recent one, wow, it was um, Editor's Choice uh, for, for 2018. Um, it was given to me by uh, American Art Collector and um, Western and Wildlife Art Magazine. But yeah, I've got... I've got a good bunch of awards that I keep on my walls so that when I'm really struggling to paint one day, I'll look at it and think, okay, I can do this. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I was talking about you to the International Wildlife Crime Stoppers Board and Lee Ellis out of South Carolina said, Grant Hacking? Grant Hacking's like a name down here, you know, <laughs> at the Wildlife Expo. So um, so he knew your name. It was very notable right away. So, right. I mean, I know he was excited to have you on board and, and, and work with us. So any future plans? Uh no, just keep doing what I'm doing. I'll, of course, I'll do um, Safari Club again. I'm uh, um, starting to paint towards that, and I'll do um, Southeastern Wildlife Expo. I've been doing those for many years, and I'll do them every year. Um, no, other than that. And, and all your art's original, basically, except for the what you did for International Wildlife Crime Stoppers, or you did some prints prior to that? Or? There are just, just a handful of prints. I'm, I'm a bit of a snob. I, I love original work, and of course it's kind of unfair because not everybody can afford it, but prints, uh, I, I'm going to start doing more prints. I'm struggling to keep up. You know, I can only paint, paint so many um, originals a year, and so I need to start doing more prints. Uh, and they... You know, the print market is, it's amazing what they can do nowadays. Like I said, the, the G-Clay is so incredible. So I'll, I'll be, you can look to see some more coming up in the future. But right now, I just have a handful and only do originals. Hmm. Nope, that's a, that's pretty neat um, just to do originals. And you've been doing it for how long? Uh, well, in this country, um, 20, tw- 22 years or so. 22 years in this country. Yeah, and, and before that? Uh, even when I was in school, the, my school was buying artwork from me. <laughs> nice. I've always painted. I'd paint on anything, anything I could pick up, uh, matches, matchboxes, uh, How many tiles. originals do you think you've produced over your lifetime, let's say? Oh, let's, not say on... let's not go there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I felt better the other day. I was watching a document, documentary on uh, Monet and um, all, all you know, those French impressionists. Yeah. And I th- think they put like, a lot more work than I, I can do. They, can, really? they really painted a lot. Uh, you know... I think to become well known, you've got to produce a lot of paintings, especially in today's day and age. You know, we, you got to put out some work, otherwise yeah. nobody's ever going to know you. Yeah, and coming with well known is, uh, I guess we should let people know if they don't know you, your price ranges too, because you know certainly I, I was kind of shocked to be honest with you when I first <laughs> met you, and we were looking at things and you were throwing out prices to me. So uh, you know, when you're talking about originals, you're, you're talking about some serious money. Yeah, I, I have you know I have friends who paint in the same areas I do and the same kind of subject and you know they their pieces can go upwards of a hundred thousand. I'm not there. I my uh, my limit right now is my my high end stuff goes in the twenty to thirty thousand range and uh, my small I, I go, tiny little pieces go for like a thousand. So between a thousand and thirty thousand. So. If you if you have the budget and the wall space, I'll paint your painting. 
<laughs> Absolutely. That's a great place to be. And, and I'm going to talk about where we have a fundraiser for Operation Game Thief New Hampshire coming up. And I've, I've kind of pushed Grant a little because uh, we had a Peregrine Falcon actually shot. And we were we set a reward for information to, to try to apprehend this person. And uh, unfortunately, we put out a press release and we did it several times. And, you know, I asked Grant to, to paint just a, a, a quickie. <laughs> <laughs> for a peregrine falcon to kind of tie into that case to tell that story still an open case still looking for information for the apprehension and one of the first questions he asked is uh why would they shoot a peregrine falcon and the only thing i can think of is it was in their bird feeder yeah so that's pretty sad because they're predators yep that's that's what they do and so. unfortunately there's so few of them around a- absolutely it's it's you know that yeah and such a beautiful bird amazing so, one of the fastest well they are the fastest bird in the, the fastest bird yes yeah. and uh just have some awesome markings on them and i had experience with uh banding peregrine falcons when i was down at Astig island national seashore which uh you know that there isn't an animal on earth that's impacted me more than the peregrine falcon yeah, they're beautiful and i'm actually looking forward to doing the painting i'll just do a, a yeah you know head, head and shoulder shot of it yeah but um and we're, we're lucky we the cliffs are right around where i live they're they're full of uh, peregrines. Yep, and I uh, lived in Dixville Notch for close to it, so we had peregrines there. And uh, Devil Slide and Stark, right where I live, we have a, a nesting pair that the Audubon goes down every year and and bands those. And one day during turkey season last year, I saw two peregrine falcons as I was working. So, wow. and one was just hovering over my cruiser as I was driving, and I'm like. It was just the most bizarre thing in the world as yeah. you're driving down the road and this bird just comes over the top of your cruiser and just kind of hangs there. I'm like, that's a peregrine. Isn't that amazing? I know yeah. You're right. yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it's, uh, you almost feel like, uh, you know, you're getting watched over, so to speak. You, you know? see, that, there's that whole experience. I mean, from a, something as small as a, as a, as a falcon, you, you just, it leaves you with that feeling that you just, you know, it's just, it's so special. Yeah. So, you know, for me trying to put that down on canvas, it's, it's such a great experience. I, I really love what I do, you know, and it sounds silly and vain, but when I'm finished a painting and it's a good painting, I feel as, you know, I walk around with a grin on my face for a while. It's a good feeling. It's like uh, there's nothing to beat it. Yeah, and, and you, you capture that experience, and that, that's why we love art. It's capturing experience. Right. If we have something that's personal to it, right. all, all the much more, you yep. know, so... Yep. I know where uh, my money will go that night, and everybody gets mad because I have a tendency to win a lot of raffles, too. <laughs> I think I'll put my wife's name down on it. <laughs> they can be mad at her for a change. So. But, um, yeah, no, uh, this has uh, been an awesome conversation. I really appreciate it, Grant. Uh, anything in closing? I always want to give an opportunity to my guests to, to, to speak out and talk. And, uh, you know, you're at Two Wild, Wild well, you're at the SCI show, you're at, in South Carolina at that show. Those are places they can see you. You plugged your, your places. How much art do those uh, art galleries actually hold that are yours? I mean, do they have like one painting, two paintings, a half dozen? Or and um, I, I try to keep at least, you know, five or six pieces in a gallery. And that's why it's a little difficult to keep them uh, kind of too many galleries because, you know, each one with five or six paintings it starts to add up. Because if, if you only have one or two people kind of walk by them, they want to see a bit of a grouping of what you do. And Gotcha. And then select from from that. So. And does each place like certain things? Like yeah, that's yeah, Jackson that's Hole wants huge elk. I, it's very very uh, geographical. I, I you know if I'm sending stuff down to Florida, it's usually got to be marsh scenes with birds, that kind of thing. Um, anything out in Jackson or or, or Colorado, that'll be moose, elk, etc. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very specific. The areas that I'm selling in will require a, sp- a specific type of painting. And people can go to your website and purchase them right from there. Yeah, um, they can always contact me, and yeah, absolutely. And they can contact you, and you can paint to whatever they want to do. Well, happily, <laughs> yes. So, and we claim you as the International Wildlife Crime Stoppers artist. So, uh, we, we, the association with you is pr- pretty special to IWC. So, yeah, and, and uh, you know, if if anybody does purchase up one of those prints that we we have uh, you know for sale and that is that's a huge compliment for me i mean it's like you know raising money for something that's important that means a lot um so please if anybody is interested in wanting to look at those and purchase one it'd be great yeah and it's going to a good cause and it's one of the very few prints out there that makes it affordable right right so and uh yeah you can get that feeling too the capture the 
the intensity that I gave to Grant over the, the Eagles and how I wanted to see them pictured. Cause, and he treated me just like a client, not like a guy <laughs> that wasn't paying a dime. So I, I certainly appreciate that, Grant. So, and I appreciate your friendship because it's, it's, it's been a cool friendship. To, you know, I always like those other people that are outside my, my wheelhouse, so to speak, to, to ground me. Yeah, if you, if you want a very fun time, just hang out with Wayne and a group of his friends and listen to all the crazy stories that they have. Go to lunch with them, I tell you what. And that's what this podcast is all about, yeah. is bringing people to those crazy stories. I know. I, I sit in my <laughs> studio where it's, you know, air-conditioned, climate-controlled. <laughs> it's all, I have my radio, everything's fun. You guys go out there and you do some, you know, dangerous stuff. So, um, for me, it's, you know, it's like listening to something that's wonderful. Yeah. No, but I'm, I'm hoping everything, everybody else is going to think it's wonderful too. So this podcast will take off. So yeah. <laughs> this is great what you're doing. Yes. Awesome. No, I really appreciate it, Grant. Right, thank, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it too. Please join me, Game Warden Wayne Saunders, and other Game Wardens on our adventures protecting wildlife, saving lives, and having fun, all while serving the public and the natural resources of our planet. Listen to the tales and experiences of those who work in the outdoors while being entertained with stories about encounters with poachers, wildlife investigation, murder investigation, near-death experiences, search and rescue missions, wildlife interactions from Game Wardens around the country and around the world. When I retired, I realized I couldn't let go of that legacy, but rather wanted to share the passion, the commitment, and the stories of those men and women that call themselves Game Wardens. This is Game Warden, Wayne Saunders, and this is Warden's Watch.